thanks for joining us here today at Victory Church, where we invite people to belong before they believe. If you want to know more about who we are and what we do, or if any of our messages have impacted your life and you would like to partner with us in giving to this ministry, we invite you to do so by visiting our website at victory.church. Now, let's check out this week's message from our lead pastor, John Chesting. So we've been in a season here uh, called Live, Move, Be. Two weeks ago, I preached a sermon called The God of Little by Little. And we talked about, it was our 30 year anniversary. And we talked about how did the Lord get us here? Well, little by little. And we, we talked about how, the, how the God is the God of yesterday, today, and tomorrow. And so what does that mean for us tomorrow? And where are we going as a church? And so for the next, for the next several weeks, we were, we were beginning to talk about this. Who are we and as a church? And where are we going as a church? And so last week, we talked about living in his presence. And it's, it's really at the core of who we are as a church is we want to live in, in God's presence. And what does that mean? And what does that look like? And remember, if you missed it, you can go back and watch it. But we talked about, it says in, in Acts 17, it says, God did this so that you would seek him and reach out to him and find him. And so you can go back and watch that last week. Uh, so our, our vision statement is to equip people to live, move, and be in the fullness of Christ. That's what we are. That's what we're about. And the, the end of that is really important, that we, we want fullness, that we want to live life to the full. When we go out every single weekend, we say, in Christ, we live life. We say it every week. We want to live life to the full in Jesus. And so it's a pursuit. It's, we're chasing after this life of fullness. If Jesus said we could have it, we want it. And so um, we want to be a church that equips the saints. And Ephesians 4 says that God gave the apostle, the prophet, the evangelist, the pastor, the teacher to equip the saints for works of service to become mature and to live into the fullness, to measure the full measure of the fullness of God. Acts 17, 28 says, in him we live and move and have our being. And so these two verses really make up who we are and what we're pursuing as a church. And we believe, the way we articulate live, move, be, is we believe that when we live in his presence and we move beyond ourselves, then we are being transformed so live, move, be. Live in his presence, move beyond yourself, and be transformed. And this becomes the pursuit of fullness, okay? So last week was live, live, uh, live in his presence. Next week, we will talk about what it looks like to be transformed. Today, we're gonna talk about the one that doesn't really sound all that exciting. Move beyond yourself, all right? So if you have your Bibles, uh, flip with me to John. John chapter three. John chapter three, verse 22, it says this, it says, then Jesus and his disciples left Jerusalem and went to the uh, Judean countryside and Jesus spent some time with them there baptizing them. At this time, John the Baptist was baptizing at Anon uh, near Salem because there was plenty of water there and people kept coming to him for baptism. This was before John was thrown into prison. A debate broke out between John's disciples and a certain Jew over ceremonial cleansing. So John's disciples came to him and said, Rab, said, Rabbi, the man you met on the other side of the Jordan River, you know, the one that you, I said, identified as the Messiah is also baptizing people. And then like in the best whiny voice you can muster up and everybody is going to him instead of coming to us. Verse 27 and John replied, no one can receive anything unless God gives it from heaven. Now, this is where we're going to dig in. You yourselves know how plainly I told you, I am not the Messiah. I am only here to prepare the way for him. It is the bridegroom who marries the bride and the bridegroom's friend is simply glad to stand with him and hear his vows. I like this. Therefore, I am filled with joy at his success. And then the real famous verse that we've all probably heard, he must become greater and greater and I must become less and less. He has come from above and is greater than anyone else. We are of earth and we speak of earthly things, but he has come from heaven and is greater than any one of us. One more supporting text and then we'll dive in. Matthew chapter seven, verse 13 and 14 says, this is Jesus, and he says, enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, 
and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. But small is the gate, and narrow the road that leads to life. One could even insert life to the full, and only few find it. Well, that's not very encouraging. We're in pursuit of life to the full, John, and you're telling me that the road is narrow and most people don't take this road. So today I, I want to take some time and I want to show you the path to fullness, okay? And it's, it's not my favorite subject, move beyond yourself, but, but I really do believe that this is such a key element to life to the full. And what I think you'll find is that it's, it's actually a pretty less populated road. And so today I want to talk to you on the subject of the less populated path to fullness, okay? Um, I have a tendency uh, to write books that few people buy. Uh, you know, my first book was called Half the Battle, and the, the subtitle is, I think, what scared people off. Healing Your Hidden Hurts. It's like, mm, no thank you. That sounds invasive, you know? You want to read a book about we're going to go to the darkest recesses of your soul and find healing? It's going to be great, you know? Uh, my next book, my second book was called Releader, How to Fix What You Didn't Break. Eh, it's not flying off the shelves, y'all. Even my next book idea uh, that, that I'm going to start writing soon is, I, I don't know if anybody's going to buy it. I mean, y'all will because you love me. But... It's, it's, it's 1 Timothy 6 that says, Godliness with contentment is great gain. You want to read a book about just being content? Eh. How, about, how about we talk about 10 steps to your next blessing instead? That'll sell. <laughs> you know? So why in the world would we put one of our core statements of our church something that wouldn't sell in a bookstore. I mean, have you ever picked up a book on the bookstore and the title of the book is Move Beyond Yourself? Eh. So why would we do that? Why, why would we make this such a core element of our church? Why would it be such a, a, a visible place of, of vision in our church? I, I, it's because that you, you, you can't read the Gospels without realizing the words of Jesus reverberating in your spirit. This is not about me. This, this life that I live is, is supposed to be, if I really want to live life to the full, if I really want to live in the fullness of everything that Jesus has for me, I can't escape the words that Jesus says in his scriptures, like in, in Luke 9, 23. He says to, to everybody in, that's there, he says, whoever wants to be one of my disciples, you can be a disciple of anybody you want to, but if you want to be one of my disciples, you must deny yourself. Pick up your cross right, daily and follow me. And then he just blisters them and says, for whoever wants to save their life will lose it. And whoever loses their life for my sake will actually save it. What good is it for someone to gain? There's that gain word. What good is it to gain the whole world but lose and forfeit your very self? the very thing that will allow you to live life to the full. So today is going to be kind of a more painful week of the three in our pursuit of fullness, but it's necessary. It's necessary. We have to talk about this because it's inescapable in the Word of God. And I want to try my best to show you that if we want to move forward in our pursuit of fullness, a very key ingredient to that recipe is move beyond yourself. So if we want fullness, we're going to talk about four things and, and the road that we have to take to get them, okay? So we're going to talk about fullness. What road do we have to take to, re to, to reach fullness? We're going to talk about gains. What road do we have to take to get gains? Uh, we're going to talk about um, success. We all want to be successful, but what road, what path do we have to take to get to the de destination called success? And we're going to talk about significance, and what road do I have to take to, to be significant? So if you're taking notes, write these down. Let's talk about the first one. In our pursuit of fullness, we must experience fullness through lessness. 
And it doesn't sound like a word. I didn't think it was either, but I actually Googled it, and it is a word. Fullness through lessness. So in God's upside-down kingdom, the path towards fullness is down this really low-traveled road called less of me lane. So, so if, if, my, if my pursuit is John to the full, I want to live into the fullness of everything that God has created me to be in every way, shape, or form. The way I'm a pastor, the way I'm a dad, the way I'm a husband, the way I'm just a human being, in my joy, in the way I, I do my resources, I want to live life to the full. God's like, okay, then you're going to take a path called John to the less. And in your path of less, you will actually find the fullness you so seek. It's such a strange dichotomy, isn't it? Uh, there's this, one of the most famous sculptures that's ever been made was made by Michelangelo. And uh, it's, it's a sculpture of David. You've seen it before. Um, and he, he carved this out of a single block of marble, just one massive block of marble. And little by little, he chipped away at this thing. And it took him three years until this masterpiece was revealed of King David. And the interesting thing is that in, in Michelangelo's mind, he pictured David all along. He knew that inside that block of marble was David. And he didn't have to add anything to it. It was already there. He actually had to chip some things away from it to reveal the fullness of what David was already existing within And I think that sometimes we view God, we view our life to the full as though I'm missing something and God must add something. God must bring the increase. God must bring more gains in order for me to be full because that would make logical sense. If my cup is half empty, I need to add something to it for my cup to become full. But I actually have found that it's actually quite the opposite, that most of my increase, most of my growth spiritually and mentally and emotionally and physically and, and, and financially has been not an addition to me, but God chipping away things from me to reveal the creation. It's, it's as if he's trying to get me back to the Garden of Eden the way that he intended it to be. And it's not as if he needs to add something to me to get me back to that place. We were created in the image of God. It's like, I don't need to add anything to you. I did that the day I breathed life into Adam. What I have to do is I have to chip some stuff away because deep inside you is the fullness of what God intends. And he's got to chip some stuff away. And you think about this principle all through scripture. You think about the awkward one that's in the Old Testament and New Testament of circumcision. You feel that awkwardness in the room right there? Everyone's like, hmm. But what was circumcision? Circumcision was a cutting away. It was a reminder of the covenant with Abraham. And then you fast forward to the New Testament. It's like, hey, it's no longer a circumcision of the flesh. Now it's a circumcision of the heart. But the principle's the same. It's a cutting away. We're gonna cut, we're gonna chip some things off of you to reveal what was there all along. So, Uh, Think about the refiner's fire. The refiner's fire says, hey, the gold, we don't need to perfect the gold. The gold's there. It's as good as it's going to get. What's keeping the gold from reaching its fullest purity is the impurities that we need to remove. So it wasn't as if something needed to be added to the gold. In fact, something just needed to be removed. And this is, this is, this is what the Lord is in the business of doing. He's in the business of shaping us and molding us like the potter's wheel. The clay must be moldable on the potter's wheel and be willing for the potter to push and nod and chip away and peel away and remove things to craft us and mold us into the image that he wants us to to become. So have, have we ever considered in our pursuit of life to the full that it might be something God chips off of you, not something he adds to you? Okay, so our first process of understanding life to the full, we need to understand just as John the Baptist said, Hey, listen, I got this thing figured out. Y'all I'm not the Messiah. I am only here to carve the path for him. I am only here to see his success. In fact, he says, I need to actually become less and less so that he can become greater and greater. So fullness 
is actually through the path called lessness, which is such a strange dichotomy. Secondly, uh, I want to go back to this verse that we read a while ago, Luke, Luke 9, 23. It says, then he said to them all, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross daily and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world, to have something added to you? Not just something, but everything. You could gain everything. The, what, everything the world has to offer you what good would that be if you forfeited or lost yourself? So number one, we're gonna, we're gonna experience fullness through lessness. Number two, we're gonna experience gains through giving. Now, you can unclutch your purse. This is not a giving message about your finances. It's, it's cool, calm down, all right? Everybody take a deep breath. Because Jesus isn't saying, it's not about your money. He says, if you wanna find your life, give your whole life. If you want to discover what life is all about, it's not about adding something to your life. It's not about adding more of something so that you can have fullness. It's actually about giving your whole life away. And that is how you're going to experience gains. So crazy, isn't it? Like everything is upside down. What is, again, what a strange dichotomy. But I want you to think about your life. In your marriage, if you're trying to gain love, what do you have to do? Give it. If you're trying to gain someone's trust, what do you do? Give them yours first. So, so giving actually produces, again, Jesus, the words of Jesus are quoted in Acts chapter 20, and it says that Jesus himself said, it is more blessed to give than it is to receive. So the words of Jesus is like, hey, if you really wanna be blessed, yes, 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 I wanna be blessed, okay, give. Because the best gains in life are actually gonna come through your heart of just giving. Um, and it applies to everything, right? It does apply to your finances, but it also applies to your time, and it also applies to your heart, and it also applies to your life. It, all, it applies to everything. It's a biblical principle. Okay, I want to get to three and four because this is where I want to camp more. So I'm going to read the same verse, Luke 9, 23, but I'm going to read it to you in the Message Bible because I just like how it pops, all right? It says, Then he told them what they could expect for themselves, Anyone who intends to come with me has to let me lead. You're not in the driver's seat. <laughs> I am. This, is, this part's not fun. Don't run from suffering. Embrace it. Ugh. Follow me and I'll show you how. Now, I love this part. Self-help is no help at all. Now, this is the part I want you to catch. self Sacrifice is the way, my way, to finding yourself, your true self. What good would it be to get everything you want and lose you, the real you, the part of you that really needs life to the full? And then again, John the Baptist articulates it a little bit differently, but it's saying the same thing. Hey, he must become greater and greater. And I must become less and less. So it's about this idea of success. We all want to be successful. So, but, but in our path towards fullness, if you want success, I'll, find you, I'll tell you what path you'll find success on. You'll find success on a road called sacrifice. Good. I didn't amen that either. I'm, I mean, it's... Um, but I want you to think about it for a second. Think about... I want you to think about the most important things in your life right now for just a second, right? Hopefully you would name your wife, hopefully, your husband, hopefully, your kids. Anything that you would say is the most valuable thing to you, guess what? It cost you something. It, you had to sacrifice. Come on, y'all. Y'all got kids? Tell me kids aren't a sacrifice. <laughs> My gosh. If you're married, come on. That's a sacrifice. If you're a Christian, guess what? And it's becoming more and more of a sacrifice in our nation. Anything that, your physical health, if you're physically healthy, you know that they sacrifice something, right? To get to that place. It didn't just happen magically. If you grow in your faith, 
That doesn't happen naturally. And we naturally drift away from the Lord. So as we grow in our faith, we know that that was sacrificial. It cost something. I was listening to a podcast um, not too long ago of Jordan Peterson. And I don't agree with everything he says, but I like the way he thinks. He makes me think. And he said something that I thought was brilliant and I never processed it this way before. And he was talking a little bit about sacrifice. And he said, he brought this topic up and he said, he said, community cannot exist without sacrifice. And if you really think about that, you think about your closest friends, think about your family, the people that you're the closest with. The reason you're close with them is because it costs you something. You would do anything for them. If they called you at two in the morning, you would drop everything and sacrifice sleep to go and help them. So true community comes through sacrifice. And we want community, you know. Pull your toes back just for a second, all right? I'm gonna step. We, we even say we want community at our churches and we hear people say, you know, I just couldn't get connected. Well, it's usually because we did, it didn't cost us anything. We have to sacrifice some. Think about, we, we always dream and, and drool over the early church, the book of Acts. We're like, yeah, the church has got to get back to that. Really? You, you better be careful what you ask for. Because the Bible says in the book of Acts that they sold all their possessions and just gave it to each other. <laughs> better read the Bible before you sign up for that one. So, so they had an out, they had an absolutely amazing community. Why? Because they sacrificed. It was sacrificial. It was sacrificial. And you see this all, all through scripture in the Old Testament, you know. I'm I'm fumbling through Leviticus right now in my yearly reading. The long lobe of the liver. I'm like, what? Leviticus and Numbers is all about the Lord telling Moses and giving him instructions on, hey, this is how I want the sacrifice to be. This many goats, this many bulls, this many, and it's all about the sacrifice. Abraham, you know, the Lord had told Abraham, I want you to sacrifice your only son. You see it all through scripture. You, you, David said, I will, not, I will not sacrifice that which cost me nothing. Sacrifice, he, they understood the cost. And then you get to the New Testament and you hear these words of Jesus. You want to find your life? Lose it. Sacrifice your own life. And what's cool is Jesus never asked us to do anything that he didn't do first. Jesus said, I didn't come to be served. I actually came to serve. And, you know, he, he didn't just come to be sacrificial. He came to be the sacrifice. <laughs> he, he became the lamb that was slain for us. You talk about sacrifice. So I, I know it's not fun, and I know it's not the most amenable sermon, but I want to introduce you to life to the full. It's actually through death. Amen. Your introduction to the greatest life you will ever live will actually come through you dying to yourself. And I'm telling you, we don't talk about this in church anymore. But sacrifice might be one of the most important elements of your entire life. It's understanding what something will cost you and be willing to pay the price. And I, I even processed this in some other ways and I jotted some notes down and I wanna read them this way. And I believe this to be true and I think you will too. Think about all the things in this life that seem detestable. Now, I want you to think about words like corruption. I would present to you that corruption is only present where sacrifice is absent. Corruption and sacrifice can't live in the same room. I would present to you that greed is only present where sacrifice is absent. So think about how important sacrifice is to allow the Lord. Part of this sacrifice is giving the chipping away tool back into the hands of God and saying, man, Lord, chip something off. I want to sacrifice. Pride is only present where sacrifice is absent. And alternatively, where sacrifice is present, love is present. And where sacrifice is present, trust is present. 
And where sacrifice is present, guess what else is present? Forgiveness. We forgive one another when we have this sacrificial heart. And we say at our church in one of our number one core values, not one of, the number one core value of this church is we are kingdom minded first. It doesn't mean that we're not other things minded. It just means that we want to take everything through the filter first of how does this impact the kingdom of God? That's what John the Baptist was saying. He's saying, this is not about me. I am not the Messiah. I am here for one reason. It's for his success. And so if he becomes greater by me becoming less, then praise the Lord. First Kings, uh, I'm sorry, First John 3, 16 says, this is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. And then Hebrews 13, 16 says, and do not forget to do good and to share with others for with such sacrifices, God is pleased. So we're not gonna, we're not gonna forget the importance of sacrifice. It's we want it to be a part of our culture. We want it to be a part of who we are as a church. Number four, we'll, we'll close with this. Number four, in our pursuit of life to the full, we're gonna take the road less traveled because we will experience significance through service. Significance through service. It's not a word we would use commonly, but really what you're after, what you're chasing is significance. You wanna be significant. Even people that don't believe in God want to be significant. We, we, we wanna do something with our time on this earth. And, and every one of your definitions of significance might be different. But they would all have one thing in common, is all of, our, all of our definitions of significance are based on what someone else says about me. It's through the lens of other people, is what I'm trying to say. So let's just imagine, let's say that you want to be significant in swimming, you want to be an Olympic athlete and you want to be a significant, you want to be remembered as a significant swimmer in the Olympics. Well, then deep down, you want Michael Phelps to say, she's good. And because Michael Phelps noticed you and deemed you significant, you feel significant. So whatever that area is, if you're a, you know, like the Dick or Dick Cook, Martha Stewart, I don't know, whatever it is, you're wanting to, you're wanting to be significant through someone's eyes. So we all have to wrestle with this question. What is significant to me? What, what makes me significant? Okay, let's do a quick exercise. Show of hands, Edmund Campus, OKC, everybody, everybody in the room. If you think Jesus was significant, raise your hand. Raise your hand, raise your hand, okay. If you don't have your hand up, whew, man, okay. So we would all agree that Jesus, through our eyes, through our lens, even people that don't believe he's the Messiah, they're like, yeah, he did some significant things. He was a prophet, whatever. But even people that don't believe he was the Messiah would say, yeah, he was a significant figure in the history, in the history books. So now we're forced to say what made him significant. What made Jesus significant? I'll show you a couple of things, okay? Mark chapter 10, verse 45 says, for even the son of man did not come to be served but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Philippians 2, 5, in your relationship with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in the very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made into human likeness. My favorite part of that verse is where it says, he made himself. No one forced him, no one told him to, he made himself. And this is the exercise that we all must do when it comes to this topic of moving beyond myself. Guess who's gonna do that? Me. I must empty myself. And it's, again, such a strange dichotomy that I would actually find significance through service. If Jesus was significant, we see how he became significant. And what you'll notice all through the Gospels is that what Jesus called 
significant, many times we would refer to as insignificant. It's the opposite. Uh, They're in the temple. Everyone's coming through, giving their little offerings. This little old widow walks in, puts two copper coins, two mites, two mites in the offering bucket. Jesus stands up. She gave more than anyone else. You're like, no, she did not. What she gave was insignificant. And Jesus is like, mm-mm. That was the most significant gift in the room. You see what I'm saying? He, he, he looks at things differently. Uh, Jesus also told his disciples, whatever you do to the least of these, you have done unto me. The most, the, the, the most seemingly insignificant thing that you do on a daily basis, God's like, mm-mm. Jesus is like, mm-mm, you do that to me. You did that to me. That was the most significant thing you could have ever possibly done. Uh, Time and time again, insignificant things. Jesus, remember this one? Uh, It's just a mustard seed. It's the smallest seed there is. It's very insignificant seed, but it actually grows into the biggest bush. Something insignificant actually becomes very significant. And I'll close with this. My favorite story um, of something that we would deem as insignificant where Jesus shows. I love this story and I'll show it to you where Jesus actually shows what he thinks about it. Okay, and if if we're not careful, we'll miss it, but I want to show it to you. It's in the book of Acts. It's in chapter seven of Acts. And what's happening here is the early church is exploding. It's going, it's booming. Um, They're needing help. The disciples are overwhelmed. And so they empower and equip a couple of people to come and be leaders. Insignificant, right? Not not Paul, not, not people that you would think, wow. No, these are people that are barely named, barely mentioned. Many of them aren't named at all. Um, but this particular one is given a name, and his name's Stephen. Okay? And I want to show you what happens to Stephen. I want you to remember, Stephen's got no stage. He's got no microphone. He, he's an insignificant. He's a layperson, right? And it says in Acts chapter 7, 54, it says the Jewish leaders were infuriated by Stephen's accusation. And they shook their fists at him in rage. But Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, gazed steadily into heaven. And he saw the glory of God. And he saw Jesus standing in the place of honor. I I was like, you're not going to cry this time, John. You've already preached it twice. You won't cry this time. I I see it. I, I can get a visual. And I love that it gives us a visual. Because Paul, Stephen's like, I, I look to heaven. They're mad at me. They're, they're enraged at me. And I look to heaven and I saw this picture and I saw Jesus standing at the right hand of the Father. Verse 56, and he told them, look, 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 look. Do you see what I see? I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man is standing at the place of honor at God's right hand. And then they put their hands over their ears and been, began shouting. They rushed at him and they dragged him out into the city, began to stone him. And his accusers took off their coats and laid them, check this out, at the feet of a young man named Saul. Well, that's Paul, y'all. The guy that would later write the majority of the New Testament. He's there endorsing this. And as they stoned him, Stephen prayed, Lord, Receive my spirit. He fell on his knees shouting, Lord, don't charge them with this sin. And uh, that's powerful enough, but I want to show you why that's important. You're like, I don't get it, John. Why are you crying? I'm crying because of the imagery that he sees. And I want to explain to you why that's important. So one, just try to imagine him being stoned, y'all. Like he's hemorrhaging. I mean, do you know how big a rock has to be and how many rocks there has to be to kill someone? In the slow, agonizing death of that, in the, in the midst of this. <laughs> he is like the Lord lets him escape from that and see something. And this is what he sees, and this is why it's significant. Because almost every other time in Scripture, when it mentions Jesus in heaven, it says that Jesus is seated at the right hand of the Father. Why is that significant? It's significant because kings don't stand. If 
if you were to go into a nation and meet the royalty of that nation and you come in, they seat, you stand. Because standing is a sign of honor. Like if the, if the, if the person you most respect on planet earth, right? If Jack Hayford walked into this room right now, I'd be like, because we stand to show respect, to show honor. And I want you to picture this. And I read that verse hundreds of times and I never caught that imagery because two times he, he, he sees it and then he tries to tell everybody else, do you see what I see? He's like, I see Jesus and he's standing at the right hand of the Father. So Jesus, I want you to, I want you to think about this. Such an insignificant thing. Stephen was not special. Stephen was not a big deal. But for Jesus, what was seemingly insignificant, he wanted to show to everybody, "Mm -mm, this is not insignificant. And I just, I just want to recalibrate our minds because what I would present to you is the things that we think are significant. The things that we think God is in heaven going, wow. I, I don't, I don't know. I'm not saying Jesus is writing those things off, but I think he is. I think, let me say it this way. I think Jesus is the most moved when we move beyond ourselves. That's the best way I could articulate it. So in Jesus' eyes, I want you to think about this. In Jesus' eyes, the most significant thing you could ever do on earth is serve. That's it? Mm -hmm. You know, I'm so thankful for the teams that make this church tick. And really, it goes way beyond what we do as pastors. It's what you guys do. It has very little to do with us and way more to do with you. And we have an amazing team. We call it the dream team. I mean, they, they are the dream team. It's what they do. They, they make this place tick. But I also wonder sometimes if we should just call it the serve team. Because we serve. The most significant thing we could ever do is just serve. And so let's, let's just recap. Okay, and we'll, we'll get out of here. You want fullness? Fully embrace lessness. You want gains? Give. Give. You want success? Sacrifice. Sacrifice. You want to be significant? Serve. That's it. So this might be the most church shrinking sermon that's ever been preached. I don't know. And I don't, I don't want you to misunderstand me. I'm not saying that everything's going to suck from now on, okay? We're keeping the padded pews. Everyone calm down, all right? We want you to be comfortable. It's all good. I'm just saying I want us to continually recalibrate our hearts to say that nothing about this church is about me. Nothing about my life is about me. And I'll say something that that may shrink our church for sure. If you want to be a part of this church, my challenge to us is let's take the road less traveled. Okay? And here's here's a couple of promises that no one would ever sign up for. Okay? If you want to be a part of this church and, and pursue fullness with everything in you, you might actually give of yourself more than you receive for yourself. You, you might actually, if you really wanna be a part of a community, if you really wanna be a part of a community, you might actually be a blessing more than you're blessed. But Jesus did say, it's more blessed to give than it is to receive. So we might mess around. I'm just saying maybe. We might mess around and actually find community. We might mess around 
and actually discover life to the full. Okay? So I want to invite you to, to go with us on a journey to a destination of fullness, but I, I do want to tell you the path there is, is uh, less populated. Okay? Let me pray for you. Lord, we thank you for who you are. We should start there. Because as significant as you are to us, you, your whole life was serving. So we just say thank you. Thank you for the sacrifices you made. Thank you that you didn't come to be served, but you came to serve. And Lord, forgive us for making this life about ourselves. And may we model your way. Maybe we, may we become servants. So God, give us the courage. Give us the, give us the desire. Give us the hope to pursue you with everything we have. And I pray, God, I pray more than anything is that you would bring fullness to this house. Help us live into everything you're calling us to be. Help this church to become everything you are calling it to be. And what we say is we are kingdom-minded first and we utter the words of John the Baptist. This is about your success, not ours. So may we become less and less and may you become greater and greater. In Jesus' name. Thank you for joining us here today for this week's message. And here at Victory Church, we are called to equip people to live in His presence, move beyond ourselves, and be transformed. And this can only happen through your radical generosity, your serving, and your prayers. If this message or any of our messages have impacted your life and you would like to partner with us by giving into this ministry, you can do so by visiting our website at victory.church. Thank you again for joining us and have a great day.